Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to The Reason We Learn. I'm your host, Deb Philman, and I am very excited for our show today. We have Travis Brown with us today of the Woke Reformation um, film. So we're going to talk a lot about that. But before we get started, please help us out by hitting the like button on this broadcast. Share it out with other people who would be interested in this topic, all things woke. And um, consider joining both of our locals communities. I have one at thereasonwelearn.locals.com. And Travis, you're at uh, Woke. Is it the signal or is it Woke Reformation? It's the Woke Reformation.locals.com. The woke, the woke Reformation.locals.com. Yeah. So without further ado, let's toss it over to Travis. Travis, tell us about the film. For you guys who haven't seen it, by the way, you can get it in the locals. So go join his locals and you'll be able to watch the film. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a bunch of other long form interviews and other content there too. But um, first, I'd just like to explain why I'm laying down for anyone who doesn't know. I have a debilitating pain condition. Thankfully, I finally have a diagnosis and it's actually getting better. So Hopefully, this will be one of the last video podcasts I have to do in my bed. <laughs> but, okay. um, but yeah, that sucks. So, Back pain is like the worst. It's it can be pretty brutal. I've had it for years at this point. So, um, but uh, yeah, I, I own my all, my all my own gear, you know, lights and cameras and all that. And I have a really great crew, a bunch of friends that help me make this series, The Woke Reformation. And, um, yeah, it starts with a couple episodes that talk about the origins of these ideas, like where did these, where did this ideology come from? And I tried to really distill it down to something that's easy to understand, you know, the roots of it in postmodernism and neo-Marxism. Um, and I was lucky enough to get Helen, the, the the experts, Helen Pluckrose and James Lindsay, to um, to narrate the first couple episodes, and then uh, and then I go on to show instantiations of this ideology in Portland and other places uh, because I live in Portland. And I had, um, you know, people like Douglas Murray in it and Ayan Hirsi Ali and Neil Ferguson and Nancy Rommelman and my friend Peter Bogosian and a bunch of other people. <clears throat> my friend Corey Drayton, who um, happens to be black, uh, but doesn't support, you know, BLM or any of that stuff. And, um, He's also a filmmaker here in Portland, and he had some pretty interesting stories. Um, he survived terminal cancer and then decided to start speaking out against the woke nonsense that he was seeing in the film industry. You know, he kept getting hired because he was black, and that was just, you know, really insulting <laughs> to him. Um, mm -hmm. And so I tell his story. I tell my my story in, in, the, uh, in the series about the fundamentalist Christian group that I grew up with and just the parallels that I see that sort of parallels in d dogmatic thinking and in group out group thinking and, and demonization of anyone who doesn't agree. Um, you know, the, the heresy and all, all the parallels that, that we're seeing, you know, with, with woke ideology. And then I also have a few episodes that are all about, you know, offering solutions, like what people can do to, to fight back or push back. Okay. Um, and it's noticed... still, still ongoing. I've, I've got more episodes coming out. So. I did notice a commenter is asking, uh, Jordan's asking, is this an atheist film or a pro-atheism film? Or are you just drawing parallels between? No, yeah. I mean, I'm technically an agnostic atheist, but no, I'm, I'm not you know, preaching atheism or anything like that. It's just, I'm just speaking, you know, the, I think it's episode five. I was just speaking from, from my point of view and from what I experienced. Um, and no, I, I really wanted this series to appeal to everyone, you know, religious, non-religious, political, mm -hmm. apolitical, any, you mm -hmm. know, any side of the spectrum. So. Well, I have wondered, um, and I think even James has, uh, James Lindsay has compared um, the woke ideas to sort of a cult yeah. and has gone through. And I think you've done this too, sort of drawing the parallels between the way cults operate and with the in-group out-group thinking and the, you know, the, we have special knowledge and if you right. join us, you'll get it. And right now you don't have it and that kind of thing. Right. Um, but the difference between <clears throat> a cult or even a cultish version or denomination of a faith, it tends to be, correct me if I'm wrong, um, mm. is sort of lack of, um, first of all, lack of autonomy in terms of like your own individual ability to engage with whatever the ideas are, whatever the deity is, whatever you have to go through the group. You can't 
right. just do it yourself. And then that there's really no redemption. There's no grace. There's no redemption. There's no coming out the other side. You know, there's this sense that if you leave the group, you're damned. If you disagree with anything they say, you're damned, which is quite different than most of the mainstream faiths right. that we, we, you know, talk about or know about today. Is that correct? Yeah. And I would say it's, it's especially true for the woke cult that there is no redemption. I mean, a lot of people have talked about this, um, but that's, that's why that's one reason why it's so pernicious is that there is no redemption. There's no solution to, you know, having privilege. You just have to constantly do the work as they say, um, which is often not very clearly, clearly defined, but you, yeah, you're supposed to just constantly work on yourself, become aware of your privilege, you know, uh, defenestrate yourself. Um, and so, yeah, that that's one of the one of the very clear distinctions between you know Christianity, <clears throat> excuse me, mainstream Christianity and um, and the woke you know cult religion, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. So, um, what what inspired you in the first place to do it? Was it just kind of seeing it all around you, or was there any one particular event or group of events? Yeah, I mean, it really did start with. Um, with my story just growing up in, it, it, it wasn't really a cult, but it, it had cult-like aspects to it um, in, in this fundamentalist Christian home and um, being told what I had to think and, and being labeled evil if I disagreed in any way. And, and I left that behind thinking, you know, well, this doesn't really suit me. You know, I'm, I'm much more liberal than this. And I moved to Seattle and then I moved to Portland. And especially when I moved to Portland, it was back in 2007, I started noticing even back then, just the same kind of dynamics of in-group, out-group thinking in leftist circles. Um, and then it just really got amplified when Trump was elected. You know, there were people burning things in the street and shutting down tra traffic. And um, and then everyone just kind of went crazy. And Antifa started to be a lot more active um, mm -hmm. during that time. And then obviously 2020 just lit that powder keg and uh, things got even crazier. And mm -hmm. so I even before 2020, I actually wanted to make a feature film about this in 2019, but I just couldn't get the funding. Um, and then when things, when the shit really hit the fan, you know, then I was able to, to get funding for this series. And, and I just wanted to sort of show some of the parallels that I saw to, to this really dogmatic, um, you know, religious belief, because it just, it seemed like this new political religion was emerging and just deranging people. And, um, you know, I saw it in the streets of Portland all the time. I mean, I used to live pretty close to, to downtown and I was constantly hearing helicopters, uh, you know, above my apartment, people were parking on the street with signs. I had neighbors that were out, in, out in the, you know, the common area making signs and, um, and yeah. And then on social media, people were just, canceling each other left and right, <clears throat> treating each other terribly, um, saying really weird and to me, really racist things about, you know, about um, um, not just white people, but just the way in which they treated black people was just really repulsive to me. And so, yeah, I've just been wanting, when I see a problem like that, I just want to do something about it. And since I'm a filmmaker, you know, that, that's the, sort of the tool of my trade. Mm -hmm. um, and I was lucky to lucky enough to get some some funding, and so, yeah. and then also, um, I had become friends with Pete in like 2016 or something. Peter Bogosian, and and he was talking about these things, and he and James Lindsay and Helen Pluckrose in 2017, I think it was, did a um, a talk about whether or not intersectionality was a, a new religion, and I filmed that and put it out there. Um, and I filmed some other events for them, but so we were just kind of very in sync and he, he is a big supporter of mine and, and helped promote me and get me all these connections to, you know, Douglas and everyone else. Mm -hmm. So, so I have, I have questions that <clears throat> I, I, you know, I hope it's not too personal, but because sure. you mentioned that you grew up, you know, in an environment in a sort of a fundamentalist home and so forth as a person who covers education and things related to children and their psyches and as somebody mm -hmm. who's con concerned with how these woke ideas are affecting children. Yeah. I'm really fascinated to understand kind of like what it, that was like for you to be in a similar situation as a child being told, you know, this is who you are. This is what you must believe, et cetera, because I really want more people 
today, parents and other adults to understand what that does to a child when they're told things about themselves. And then the next thing is obviously something, some influence, something about you. And I'd be curious to know what you think it is. Was it personality? Was it an outside influence that kind of enabled you to see outside of that bubble? So I'm fascinated because right. we're all trying to protect kids. And so you're sort of an example, grown up kid, sort of. Yeah, I'll just, I guess, take the second question first. It's something I've thought a lot about, and I, I don't know if I have a good answer for it. There, there was no outside influence. Um, you know, what I, the music I listened to, the books I read, the movies I watched all needed to be either Christian and a very specific type of Christian, or they needed to be okayed by my parents. Uh, otherwise, I just wasn't allowed to, to watch right. or listen or read to, to these things. So I, I, I I really think it was just my own innate moral compass that led me to start questioning it. It wasn't that I thought, oh, there's there's no evidence for this or anything like that. It's just th there were certain aspects of some some of the beliefs that just really bothered me and mm -hmm. seemed frankly immoral to me. There's a lot of preaching from the Old Testament, and you know it was a very Old Testament sort of version of Christianity. And so, yeah, it's hard to say why I started questioning it other than it just, it bothered me on some, some deep level. And, um, and it was a very slow process of starting to question and losing, you know, friends and, and leaving behind family members because I just, uh, I just couldn't be myself, um, in that situation. Um, and as far as what it does to, or what it did to me, I mean, it certainly robbed me of any kind of self-confidence that I could have because I was told I was, this wretched, miserable creature that do doesn't deserve anything and deserves to burn in hell forever. And the only way that that isn't going to happen is if I have this cer certain set of beliefs and, you know, engage in these, you know, behaviors, rituals, et cetera. So yeah, it's, um, I mean, it's, it's obviously a different situation, uh, mm -hmm, sure. but it was very terrifying be to be told these things. And again, it, it robbed me of any self-confidence and I've had to really work on that. Um, you know, throughout my adult life. And yes, it's, it had a number of negative effects, but I, I'm not sure it quite maps on to um, the way children are being, right. you know, influenced by CRT or, or anything like that. Well, the, the, the woke do a, a better job probably of window dressing, like dressing things yeah. up in sort of sing songy voices, little nursery rhymes, right. things that kind of wrap something in, a, we love you. You're evil. You know, it's like, it, it's, <laughs> right. you know, you're an oppressor, but we love you. It's like more along the lines of when people, you know, are verbally or physically abusive and they say they're doing it because they love you or they're doing right. it. Because, it's gaslighting. Yeah. It's yeah, like, I'm just trying to make you a better person. Right. I right. am hitting you because I love you. Right? Or I'm saying these things to you and it's, or it's not your fault that you're so tainted. <laughs> it's not your <laughs> fault that you're this terrible person. Right. Um, or in the case of that book we talked about before we came on that, you know, not my idea. It wasn't your idea to be born white, but you know, now that you are, <laughs> let's tell <laughs> right. you why you should be so guilty about that. But it does sound, um, can you explain to the audience how the average lay person can differentiate between a thought and a belief. The difference between a thought and a belief. Uh, yeah. So for example, what I keep trying to explain to people <laughs> is what, what bothers me about the woke stuff mm -hmm. is these aren't your garden variety opinions. It's not like we have a difference of opinion, right? They're expressing a belief system. Sure. Right. As right. that's how I feel, but I'm doing a really bad job of explaining how I know it's a belief system versus, mm. A different set of thoughts well first they're extremely good at propaganda i mean marxists typically are really good at propaganda i mean the fact that anyone in the united states could look favorably on marxism is just proof of how good they are at at right. the window dressing right um so it, it, it's these are basically ma manufactured beliefs largely from our university system from you know, activist scholars, especially in the 80s and 90s, and and more today. Um, but yeah, there there it's it's really complicated and complex because there are so many different facets of this uh, that that came from you know gender studies, uh, African studies, you know, uh, queer studies, you know, critical race theory, critical legal studies. Um, so it's it's 
it's difficult because with you know with um the Bible, you can just look at the Bible and you, and you can see, okay, these are the beliefs that, that you're supposed to hold. And it's, it's much more cut and dried. Whereas with this, you know, there are something like ecclesiastical texts, but they're usually pretty esoteric and often hard to understand. I mean, there are more popular books like, you know, White Fragility and How to Be an Anti-Racist that kind of act as a scripture. Um, and I guess one thing I would say is that often the, the beliefs are just assertions without evidence. And, you know, thoughts are certainly make up the content of uh, of a belief. It's, you know, it's a fundamental part. I of... should have said idea rather than sure, belief sure. or something, you know, yeah. because I mean, and they're all thoughts and they're all ideas to a certain degree, right. but the, it seems like the missing component is the evidence. Yeah, yeah, for right. sure. Right. Yeah. I mean, they're just, they're, they're constantly just making these assertions like Peggy McIntosh is uh, unpacking the in, invisible knapsack it was just, you know, all these sort of revelations that she had about her white privilege, but they're just assertions with no evidence whatsoever. Um, and, right. and a lot of this stuff is, it's just people have what Pete talks about is they have a moral impulse and they discharge that moral impulse into journals or articles or books and then they often, if they're in the university system, they get tenure based on on those and uh, on those articles and in, in these journals. And then they, you know, they get tenure and then they uh, just start testing students on on, you know, their own made up nonsense. <laughs> and so that's right. how it pro proliferates and becomes a solidified belief system. Um, it's really, you know, through the universities. And now it's obviously much worse with social media and um you know, these ideas can propagate, these beliefs can propagate much more easily that way. Mm -hmm. And you know, what strikes me is, you know, James talks about the iron law of woke projection. I guess a lot of people talk about that. But what I notice is there seems to be a, like an inverse relationship between courage and initiative and these beliefs. So in other words, mm. it looks like to mm -hmm. me, like people are off, like sort of outsourcing the morality to these texts, to these ideas. Right. And when it comes right down to it, it's really lazy thinking. So like when you read them, yeah. they seem emotionally satisfying, but only like, oh, kind of like how vanilla ice cream is, emo is satisfying. It's like, <laughs> oh, this tastes so good. Sure. But like five minutes later, you're hungry again. There's something kind of missing um, of substance. Yeah. But yet in order to approve of it, it's, it's like really easy to approve of it because it has that veneer of being morally virtuous. Right. As long right. as you don't think about it too much. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, and, and it's interesting because certain types of people are primed to not think about it too much. But I have very intelligent friends here in Portland, you know, PhDs who who buy into this stuff and it blows my mind. You know, I, I was making an, another film, When in Doubt, uh, with my progressive friend, Matt, and, you know, we were having our own conversations kind of behind behind the scenes and filming them. And I remember sharing with him the book White Fragility because yeah. I thought, oh, OK, you know, I'll share this with him and he'll get it. He'll understand why I don't like this ideology, the problems I have with it. No, that's not what happened. He loved the book <laughs> and it blew my mind because like, I, I mean, it's just it is so empty and it's it's also really caustic and terrible. And yet. Uh, for whatever reason, it appealed to him, and we had so many conversations about it. it. Was it was very fascinating. So, you know, what it's... do you think is the type of person who would read? You know, because I've been so fascinated by this, and I know people also who, you know, read these books and they say like, "No, you really should read it." I'm like, "No, I have read it." I'm like, no, <laughs> right. you couldn't possibly have really read it. Meanwhile, there's me thinking you couldn't possibly have really read it. <laughs> like, so we're both right. talking past each other, believing the other person couldn't possibly have really read it and coming out on the other side with completely different opinions about it. Yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, again, I think social media has has ex exacerbated this problem. I mean, w we all are watching different movies. I think this is, um, uh, oh, what's his name? The creator of Dilbert, um, Scott Adams. Scott I think Adams, he, yeah. he was talking about this on a podcast with Sam Harris that, you know, the different people um, based on their you know social media history and what the which news channel they watch, et cetera, are are watching different movies unfold. Basically, they, they're in their own realities that are very different. And, you know, so that's it's partly it's partly an issue of 
partisan media. It's partly an issue of um, algorithms and social media that create these bubbles that that then inform people in a particular way. And so, you know, if you know my friend Matt happens to be progressive, and so you know he listens to NPR, reads the New York Times. So all all of these sources of media have been completely uh, corrupted and completely bought into the woke narrative. And so as a result, uh, there's, you know, cherry picking of, of data about like police and p- police and, and black people or, or, you know, that sort of thing. So then when they, this so is primed, I think through, through the media, through social media to then look at a book like white fragility and think, Oh, you know, like this is, this is a solution to this, this problem of, of privilege and, and, you know, whatever, whatever else other problems she was trying to solve. I don't, not really clear on what they were, but um, yeah. So it's, I mean, it is, it is amazing because it's, we're all getting information from different sources and we're enveloped in the, in these silos. And um, so that, I mean, that, that's one reason I'm trying to make this other film when in doubt, which is to sort of break through that those silos and communicate across these ideological divides because I mean, that's, that's the only way we get at anything like the truth is talking to people we disagree with and and you know um having having new information come in that that we otherwise wouldn't have but i keep coming <clears throat> back to the idea that there's still something missing like in other words we could talk to each other we could make things more civil we could share ideas but i'm mm-hmm. not sure we would really do much of it you know we, we wouldn't just walk away feeling the same thing or maybe a few people would be persuaded for whatever reason but i don't know if it would stick and without a core set of principles in other words sure. like i truly believe i and i actually know for a fact because i grew up in new york city i grew up surrounded by new england liberals and you know i went to college in new england i was just absolutely fish out of water from mm. the youngest age i did not share anybody's views. And I was like that from the beginning. And the only thing I can think of is that at a, at a pretty young age, I was exposed to my grandfather, my father taught me to form a set of, you know, form or adopt a set of core principles. Like, what do you mm-hmm. believe about the world? Like look right. around the world and what do you think is true and how, and why do you think it right? So this became my moral compass. Like you talked about your moral compass. Mine was, where's the evidence? I grew up in a family of litigators. Okay. So Mm. that didn't hurt. (laughs) But so when I would go to college or grad school and people would be throwing Palo Freire in my face or saying, this is what's true and so forth. I always had the same question. Well, how do you know? And where's the evidence? Right? So if they're not showing it to me, then I'm kind of like, well, you haven't, you cannot possibly persuade me. You cannot possibly win me over. That doesn't mean I'm your enemy but you're mm-hmm. not going to win me over. So that's like the first thing. Sure. And then the second piece was I, as I grew older and read more of like, you know, John Locke and things like that, I started forming my own set of principles of like, you know, natural rights and the individual and so forth. So when people would start speaking to me about groups, group identities, group rights, and I, I was like, mm-hmm. mm, that doesn't make any sense. But because I already had this core set of values, so the evidence didn't just have to be evidence. It had to be evidence that didn't violate that. What I feel like I'm seeing is a lot of people on all sides. This is not like a one-sided thing. Mm -hmm. I'm just seeing people who seem to be more unmoored, for lack of a better Mm -hmm. term. They don't seem to have a core. So that makes it harder, I think. And, And when... Then, like, what are you measuring this information against? What are you weighing it against? Other right. than how do I feel about it? Sure. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And I think that um, pe- people do need a set of core values. Um, one, just to function as a you know flourishing society. And two, just personally and interpersonally to have a sense of meaning or purpose, um, I think is, is crucial. And I think the, the the lack of that uh, across the United States and other countries is partly what leads people to go off their feelings to to buy into this new woke narrative that uh, that gives them those those reasons for being that gives them those values etc. I mean it, it it tells a very uh, it's certainly not a convincing story but it's a, it's a very persuasive story to some people. Um, because right. it ha- it has the villains and it has the good guys and it has steps of what you need to do to achieve 
you know, enlightenment and, um, <laughs> and it has all the pieces, um, you know, that, that appeal to, to people since we, we, you know, we're a species that really loves narratives and stories. It, um, it just fills that, that void, unfortunately for a lot of people. We seem to like certainty too. Yeah. It feels like, yeah, the, the yeah. comfort with ambiguity ha seems to have gone backwards. So when I think of like modern humans, I think of all kinds of advancements and all kinds of ways of thinking that we're more comfortable with than let's say more primitive humans. Like mm -hmm. we're, um, I read the other day and I'm not sure where I read it, honestly, but about how civilization or free, free society where individuals get to do what they want is sort of like a garden carved out of the jungle, mm. but you have to constantly tend it and constantly tend it or else the jungle will take it over. Jungle maybe being the more primitive like tribal alliances and all right. this. And because the garden is not natural, it's not what we're like naturally inclined to do. So we have to manually, intentionally tend it. Mm -hmm. And similarly, our ability to live in sort of modern pluralistic societies without tribes you know, where we all, you know, we look different, we come from different religions, whatever, but we're still coexisting in the same country, right? We're not right. falling into our groups of my group, your group, my team, your team, that that's actually kind of where we spent more of our evolutionary history. Sure. Than this, and that we, you know, so comfort with ambiguity, um, the idea that I, I don't know what I don't know, and I should, I need to learn rather than falling right. back into this other stuff. And we're, sort of regressing to the primitive a little bit yeah yeah it's really unfortunate that's why i titled my other film when in doubt because in general i think of doubt um in a much more positive light than most people do mm. um because i think that it I, I wouldn't say it's just explicitly a virtue but i think it can be in mm -hmm. certain circumstances mm -hmm. and a, a good example i i don't remember where i heard it but is of this um this jihadi, this, you know, suicide bomber who had a car bomb and was going to blow some people up. And it, for some reason it was delayed and he, he was stuck in the car with his phone and was Googling contradictions in the Quran and just doing that. And just, you know, obviously to kill yourself for a religion, you have to be 100% certain that that's the right thing to do sure. without any doubt. Right. So when he was googling googling contradictions in the Quran and came across some things that started to bother him, he started to doubt a little bit, and then he avoided doing the bombing, uh, which I think is just really profound, and it just shows that you know, it's 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 okay to not be so convinced <laughs> all the time. And like you said, I think people should admit that when they don't know something, I think right. that's a, a very uh, humble and and wise thing to do, rather than spouting off certainties and you know in a particular direction when maybe you don't have evidence or maybe we, we should be open to changing our minds um so yeah it's I, also very liberating i think i mean right. i think it, it creates a lot of anxiety and pressure to feel like you have to have an answer for everything and you have to know all the facets of the subject even the one that you're talking about so what i know when i see people arguing let's say on the internet it seems like it's really hard to find people who say, you know, I honestly don't know. I'll have to check into that and get back to you. Or, right. you know, that's a really good question. I'll have to, uh, I'll have to go check that out. Or I only know up to this point. And then after that, it's a little bit of a mystery. And right. I think so many entrenched arguments, fights, things that turn into ugly battles would be avoided if people just reached the point of where they either don't know or they aren't sure and admitted it. Totally. You're kind of like off the hook now. What's the worst that could happen? The person says, well, you better go figure that out and be like, yeah, you're right. I better <laughs> you oh, yeah. can do it. Now you don't have to continue your argument, you know, for sure. Yeah, you don't I, have to I win. <laughs> exa exactly. Yeah. Just 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 admitting that you don't know something when you don't know it would would save it would reduce a lot of polarization and it would, it would avoid a lot of unnecessary fights. And I just think it would it would help people be a little bit more curious and, uh, you know, actually, like you said, go out and find out about this subject or, you know, right. and, and that's it's really unfortunate that people get so entrenched in their identity level beliefs that they feel they need to, you know, spout certainty about really anything, uh, you know, w whether it's on the left or the right. I mean, obviously, you know, when we're talking about woke ideology, there, there sort of is a prescriptive answer for everything. And 
it behooves a person to feel like they can be confident in all of their beliefs and um and and just appear like they're on the morally you know right side or the right side of history as people like to say right you know i wonder sometimes if the fact that we live so much of our lives in these two dimensional spaces with a lot of white space to fill and we have this little avatar or a little image or whatever that we might have accidentally started to equate our existence with filling this space mm. like if if somebody isn't reading my thoughts every day do i exist if the tree falls in the right. forest and nobody hears it you know am i still here if i don't fill that space and right. when you are engaged in a written back and forth and back and forth which is increasingly how people are interaction interacting mm -hmm. if there's this feeling of i will disappear or i don't exist or somehow i am lesser than if i can't answer or put something Engage. in there yeah. Yeah. If I can't engage. And I, d I don't think that's healthy to do that. Yeah. No, not at all. Um, yeah. And it's not just, I, I think it's not just engaging, but it's engaging and showing that you are on the right side. Like that's such a, right. an important, and then just demonizing the other person because, oh, they, they like Joe Rogan or, you know, whatever, <laughs> whatever the issue is. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really unfortunate. And, and that's why, uh, what's that? The virtue signal, but even, yeah. you know, we have that expression, the virtue signal. And then I come back to, but who cares? Meaning like until I still don't, but I don't remember. And maybe I just wasn't paying attention before the notion of woke became a mainstream thing we all knew about. And I know these ideas are really old. It's not like it yeah. just, we just woke up one day and they were there, but before it became a mainstream thing, if you go back to, let's say the nineties, I don't particularly remember people around me being all that preoccupied with appearing virtuous. Now mm. I've met people who say they do like they grew up in small towns or in communities where sure. it was like, what church do you go to? And there, so there was right. that sort of worrying what you look like as far as virtue goes, or conversely people who are in the elite of the elite who are doing lots of charity work and big uh, events. And like, mm -hmm. did you do this? Did you give money? But I was fortunate. I was in that kind of, not religious group of people didn't have any money to do giant charity events. And I was yeah. like, doo, 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 just checking along with my life. And I never felt like anyone was checking up on what a good person I was. And yeah, I much prefer that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Likewise. It was an easier life. Like don't people realize they're making life life a lot harder for themselves unnecessarily. Like no one sure. cares. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, again, obviously social media makes that problem worse, but also just the politicization of everything uh, makes that problem much worse. You know, it's really unfortunate. I've been reading Matt Taibbi's book, uh, Hate Incorporated, where he talks about just the fact that the, the news media is a business model. And one of the main goals is obviously just to get money and to get clicks. And one of the main ways to do that is to create these moral panics and, you know, uh, stir, stir up hate for one side or the other. Um, and so, you know, it's, there are many factors at play here, I think. Um, but yeah, so social media and the media really make it a lot worse than it needs to be. I think. Do you think there are personality types or, um, uh, who are more susceptible to this than others? The virtue signaling. Specifically, well, no, just or... feel being vulnerable to being ginned up in the first place. Like I said, mm, I mean, sure. I could sit and watch a steady diet of that stuff and I probably, I, I, I wouldn't like it. I would mm. find it nauseating and I'd want to turn it off, but it wouldn't change my mind. Like I would just be observing it almost like you're watching a car wreck in small, slow motion. Sure. Yeah. But there are people who watch that and they're like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, like they, it actually <laughs> bothers them. Sure. Yeah, I mean it's it's a great question. I'm I'm not a psychologist. I would have to defer to um to yeah. experts in that field, but I, I would I would imagine that's probably the case that there are certain you know personality types, psychological profiles that um that tend to and I and I don't know what they are, but that tend to absorb the, the news and really believe it and really get as you said gen ginned up about it for sure. Now I imagine as a filmmaker, you're probably a free speech absolutist right i mean you're you're free speech all the time you know pretty, pretty much i mean i think some people have pointed out that you know that free speech isn't necessarily absolute like if you call for violence um you know right. there's certain exceptions that i think 
are pretty reasonable, but outside of those exceptions, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think people should be able to speak their minds and, you know, I think, like I said before, just free and open communication is just crucial, I think, to one, getting at something like the truth, an approximation of the truth, and two, figuring out the best way to do things, the best way to, you know, uh, raise children or, uh, you know, uh, build a society, et cetera. Like we, we absolutely have to, have, it's just su such a crucial thing to have open and free communication for sure. Now, what if you, so thinking back on the, the, um, the people who put these ideas into our universities, into our, into our society in the first place, you know, people like Derrida and Foucault and, you know, mm -hmm. Rousseau and you know, like whatever. And then those in the university who sort of pulled them in and taught them to the younger generation, um, it's pretty obvious that going back pretty far, they were selective in that they tended to put more and more and more of the postmodernist, you know, flavor to it, mm. obviously preferred that obviously conveyed to students. This is the right way. This is the better way to see the world and think about right. things. And we have now arrived at a place where you'd be hard pressed to, as a student under even no that there are different ways of looking at that, that or to, you right. will be told explicitly those are racist, like those are bad, they're colonial, they're terrible. Right. So, you know, people have talked about fighting the woke ideas with bans and with restrictions and whatever. Mm. But then, you know, the side of me that's free speech is saying like, well, first of all, I don't think they work. I don't think you can ban bad ideas. I think the better way yeah. is to expose people to the better ideas and compare side by side and they don't, they don't hold up. The bad ones don't hold up. But, does it then follow that we should be mandating coverage of alternative viewpoints, things like a fairness doctrine or, mm. you know, in universities having a quota for professors that teach things a different way or make students right. pick, like, I don't like compelled speech any more than I like censorship. So yeah. as a person who's very concerned with individual rights, I find myself stymied by all this woke stuff because you have this repressive tolerance Mm -hmm. that is coming into play what what do you think about like i get a headache even just thinking about it yeah it's it's a great question um i don't know if i have a, a great solution i mean i'm i might be i might lean more toward being in favor of you know a certain number of like conservative faculty or something like that i'd probably be more in favor of that than you know these diversity programs that uh, force a certain number of minority you know people in a particular position but i think that's just demeaning to those people and it's often just not really what we need and very helpful um so yeah i'm i'm, I'm definitely for that diversity of ideas um uh, and yeah how to get there is really is really challenging i'm i think i agree with you that I, i'm i'm not really for banning things um but i, I don't know i in in certain circumstances like i don't think you know critical race theory belongs in K through 12 schools. Um, I, I'm, I'm more in favor of getting rid of it there when it comes to the college level courses, absolutely, you know, teach, teach it. But the way in which people teach it is really important. Um, as I outlined in my, my last episode on critical, critical race theory, you know, it's, it's, uh, the lens through which people see everything and it's not necessarily um, taught in, in the way that you teach any, any other idea where you bring in people who are for it and people who are against it, and then you have a debate about it. We really need that kind of structure, especially mm -hmm. in, in college. Um, and, you know, it's just going to get, it's just going to get worse because it's not just in college anymore. You know, it, it's in K through 12 schools. So by, right. by the time they get to college, um, they're already going to be primed to think that way that, you know, that anything that deviates from this particular norm is, colonialist or you know racist or whatever um exactly. so yeah it's it's a it's a tough it's a tough thing i'm 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 not sure what the solution is um but i think i would be in favor of at least banning uh banning some things in in certain circumstances just just because of the the toxic outcomes well i think um in the in the k-12 setting um i think if we were to uh, reinforce the notion that everything taught to, to minor children, like we could like stick right. that. Okay. Yeah. Should be as 
rely as much on objective fact as is possible. And that right. where you're teaching material that is open to interpretation, that teachers be held accountable to present it in a neutral manner. So in other words, you know, it, no polemics, right. no, uh, no, no, you know, we're going to read this book and we're going to, and I'm going to sit and tell you exactly what I think about it. You know, that should be present. I don't even remember knowing what my teacher's political mm -hmm. uh, affiliations were, nor did I want to know. Right. Sure. And so there are ways to teach many of these books. And then I think also sticking to things like high quality canonical texts by canonical. I don't mean everything was written 200 or 300 years ago. I just mean it's kind of stood the test of time. Newberry award winners, th things that, that are not mm -hmm. just, kind of the equivalent of literature junk food, right? Yeah. Um, and and just taught in a neutral manner. I think, especially in taxpayer funded schools, they they should be able to say at least that much. Where it gets mm. it gets dicey is people say, well, what is neutral? And you're like, well, you shouldn't be expressing your political views to the children. I think it's right. kind of like porn. We know it when we hear it. We know it when we see it. Yeah. Um, you don't hang a Che Guevara flag in the classroom. Right. <laughs> right. Right. You don't put teach Black Lives Matter. That's a political organization. You know, so right. I I think it's an inherent conflict of interest to take a government run school and present political ideas. Yeah, yeah. Political it seems pretty or obvious. Re religious. I mean, and I think that there's um I think that right. you know woke can be classified as a religion. And given the the separation of church and state, I, I think that that should apply especially K through 12 schools. Like, again, I think all these ideas like perfectly reasonable to have this balanced viewpoint in college when people want to learn about these things, but right. forcing them, forcing whether they're religious or political or some combination of the two uh, onto children, I think is just, it's reprehensible. I just don't think it should happen. Like you said, right. I think that the teachers should be neutral, present the information the best they can, but really what, what should students be learning about? They should be learning about, mathematics they should be learning about you know really you know functional things that help them succeed in the world rather than these this moralizing that's occurring um so yeah i just i just don't think it belongs more, more even than that they should be learning how to learn and you can't mm, sure. learn how to learn if your teachers approach you as young as six and give you fully formed you know opinions as fact right and right. that's cutting you off at the at the knees right there because you're going those habits of mind skepticism first of all nobody in k through five is even cognitively capable mm -hmm. of skepticism they're just mm -hmm. not they they're they're concrete thinkers up to about the age of 11 or 12 and they tend to believe what they see or what right. they're told by people older right that's pretty common so the teacher's taking a lot of liberties to present something as a fact with a kid in that age range they have zero capacity to challenge you they don't have the vocabulary the reading skills the breadth of knowledge the life experience and the power differential is so obvious like right. it's abusive to suggest otherwise above 12 you're still dealing with kids who are mostly pre-rational right like their mm -hmm. frontal cortex not fully formed so right. i just think they should be you know the neutrality is more about like learning how to learn. You learn math facts so that you can learn higher level math. Mm -hmm. You learn vocabulary, spelling, grammar, <clears throat> writing, so you can then go learn other things. It's not that we expect kids to come out of 12th grade knowing like this set of facts, unless mm -hmm. they involve teaching you how to learn more other things. But sure. we're not giving kids that power. And right. instead we're saying things like innocence is overrated. <laughs> yeah insane it's it's yeah. crazy to me but now do you think do you think there's hope <laughs> uh, i think so uh, i wanted to touch on what you just said there because it sounded like initially you said you were against bans but from your argument it sounds like that would be a really good reason for banning some of this stuff is that what do you think it's, what do you think about that let me put it this way it's such a technical answer. I'm yeah. against like the legislature or the governor going, I hereby ban CRT in K-12. Mm -hmm. I would be more comfortable with a governor selecting board members of boards of education who were committed to the principle of neutrality in K-12 education and then say, 
from now on, you're going to have full transparency for the parents. You're going to allow rights to observe in the classroom for these parents with minimal notification. They don't need a week's notice. They could just, you know, send notes saying, I'd like to stop by tomorrow, whatever. Mm -hmm. You're going to make all these materials visible. You're going to adhere to the state standards. Don't, don't be coloring outside the lines. No more psychology in the classroom with little kids. Like, so it's not just CRT. It's like, mm -hmm, let's right. get back to basics and teach the kids the academic skills they need to have. And what I, and anything that's outside that will simply not be funded. If you mm. cannot demonstrate that there is evidence to support the curriculum you're going to put into the classroom, don't expect anyone to pay for it. Expect pushback. That is, is a little different than what they're writing up. You know, what they're mm. writing up is we hereby ban CRT. Well, that, that, of course you're going to get pushback. But I'd sure. like to see the people argue with what I, you know, what I just said. Mm -hmm. Why are you arguing that the main focus should be teaching them to read and improving their proficiency in math and sticking to the materials that are evidence based, where you can demonstrate that these work, right? And 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 we don't have money for outside of that. So there isn't money to do BLM in the classroom. We don't do that. That's not mm -hmm. what we're here to do. And I think, keep, you know, keeping obvious politics out of the classroom is you can do. So that's, again, it's not a ban on a specific idea. It's a sure. ban on a type of teaching. Yeah, that makes sense. Does that makes sense. It's like I what think, we used yeah, to do. So, yeah. which is, can we just go back yeah. to what we used to do? <laughs> sure. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And I think it would be interesting to have case studies on which which option worked better in terms of, uh, you know, improving sc scholastic performance, whether it was banning or just not funding. And, and it would be interesting to kind of see, see that play out. Right, right uh, now there's a lot of funding and um, what we're seeing is, you know, ARPA funds, as an example, this is money that the Biden administration set aside supposedly for like COVID stuff. You know, there were mm. three different infusions of money. This one is going exclusively to SEL, which you've probably heard about. It's kind of like, the little Trojan horse carrying all the critical theories into the classroom. Mm. And they're spending just billions of dollars on wow. practicing psychology without a license in the classroom. Right. If the federal, if, if the federal government weren't doing that, or if governors had the spine to say, we're not taking the money because we don't have time and space and expertise to be doing that in the classroom in the first place. So why would we take money earmarked for that? We're not going to do right. it. Thanks, right. but, but no thanks. Then you you could see possibly see a stop to it. But how many politicians are comfortable saying to their constituents, I'm turning down billions of dollars? Sure. Yeah, right. Very hard. A problem. <clears throat> for sure. Yeah. So anyway, but that's so yes, I'm for a kind of a ban, but not most of the ones that I've read. Some are pretty benign. I've read some of them. They're not so bad. I just yeah. don't think the way they're being implemented will be effective. Put it that way. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. So yeah, you, you'd asked if, if there's hope. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I, I think so. Um, I mean, I kind of operate on under that assumption making these these films. <laughs> um, and I, I, I don't think there's hope if, if no one's going to do anything about it. But we see so many people, um, whether they have their, their own show or you know, in this case, making a film about it, or yeah. there, there are people out there like Osra Nomani who are activists that are pushing against this stuff. And so, yeah, I just, I, I think that one really crucial thing is content like this and is making films. So something that's easily understandable and digestible so that people can wake up to it and connect. I mean, I've been just blown away um, at how many people have, even here in Portland have reached out to me privately and said like, Oh, I saw your trailer or I saw the, you know, this episode and like, I'm, I'm just so glad you're doing this. This is amazing. I mean, I've had people send me gifts from all over the country and like, it's, it's been incredible. So just, you know, I was, I was actually really anxious about releasing this, especially living in Portland. I've, I've had terrible anxiety and panic attacks and insomnia for about a year. Uh, mm -hmm. It's been brutal, but the reality is that like my anxiety is way worse than what's actually happened because what's actually happened is, I've gotten like 95% positive feedback, whether it's online or in, in person. I mean, I've had some, you know, there are some studios I can't rent now in Portland because people think I'm a transphobe or a racist or whatever. It's just stupid stuff. People, people that don't even know me, haven't had a conversation with me. And now I have this reputation in the Portland film community, um, or at least in some of it. So, you know, it sucks, uh, but it's not the end of the world and I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing, you know. Um, so, yeah, I think the more people understand what's going on and understand 
how to have or you know know the tools to to push back. Um, yeah, I just I see it all over the place. So I I do think there's hope. Um, yeah, I think more <laughs> people. I still believe that the majority of Americans are like you or like me or you know that look around at all the stuff and just roll their eyes even if right. they're not super invested in it, you know like they don't see how how bad it is i think they aren't bought into it um for sure it's the fact that the mainstream media social media like funnels it in you know in such a way that it looks like it's amplified they you know this tiny percentage of people look like they're much more powerful than they actually are right and then of course they run with that um, right. So in a weird way, they end up being more powerful than they ought to be. Sure. Um, but that doesn't necessarily map to reality. How bad do you think it would have to get to before the average person became unwoke in the sense that, you know, let's say like I would count myself as being unwoke, meaning that I'm, mm -hmm. you know, walking around every day fighting the stuff you obviously right. are people like James, Peter, et cetera. But the average person is like still going through their life, doing their thing. If it comes up, they're like stupid virtue right. signalers, whatever. And then they ignore it. What do you, how far do you think would have to go before average people were, you know, ready to drive their truck across the country and honk all day or whatever, you know, like, right. whatever. Is going yeah. On. It's, it's hard to say. I mean, typically the way that people push back or, you know, participate is by voting in a particular way. Right. So that's one reason people voted for Trump was because they saw this madness and they thought oh, this guy is going to be a bulwark against it. And that, and therefore they voted for him. I mean, there's many other reasons, of course, but um, yeah, I, I, I think just, I think the more information that gets out there about it and the more, you know, actual Marxist thought is being pushed for in schools and the more people are aware of that, then I think the more, more people will, will start wanting to push back. Um, so it, it's hard to say, um, you know, how bad it would have to get, but I think if people just have the information, uh, and realize that it's already pretty bad, then that will obviously motivate some, some people are still just naturally going to just want to raise their ch children and, and, you know, do their job. And that's totally their prerogative. You know. Right, right, of course. Which do you think works better as far as messaging? The the messages like "be afraid," this stuff is really terrifying, or the ones that say like "life is actually a whole lot better than the woke are painting it out to be." Or do you think it's equal measure to both? I mean, I I like the combination. I mean, I, I, that's what I tried to kind of do in my series was offer some some hope and and to show how how good things actually are. I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of Steven Pinker and Hans Rosling who both wrote books about, uh, you know, the decline of violence and, and then also just how much richer we are and how much better things are now than ever before. Um, and it's something I'll probably touch on in, in the film version of my series, I'm hoping to, to turn it into a feature film and get it out there. But um, yeah, I think, it, I think it's really important to outline the problem and show like, wow, this stuff is really bad, but not just leave it at that. I mean, that, that would just be nihilistic. <laughs> and right, so sure. mm -hmm. I think it's really important to, to then say, you know, here are some values that we do actually all share as Americans or as human beings. And um, th there is there is something much more than this and something much better than this. And, you know, we should we should get back to just living our lives and, and flourishing as a society. I think that's that's crucial. Yeah. It's, it's tough because, you know, even I go back and forth, there are days like this morning where I wake up and I'm just like, why isn't everybody lighting their hair on fire about these kids? You know, because some of the things yeah. I see the woke teachers doing, I would classify as child abuse. Sure. There's no other way. I mean, James has done a series about groomer, you know, groomer <clears throat> schools and stuff. Right. And I completely agree. That's what's happening. Um, even some of the ideas that aren't related to the gender ideology or the sex ed, mm -hmm. just teaching a child they're an oppressor or they're oppressed, I think is abusive. Teaching them, this is your identity because I said so, I think is, that happened to you as a child. Right. This is who you are. This is what you must believe. And if you don't, you're going to hell, like you're damned. Something is terrible. Right. I just think that is terribly abusive. And sure. I it, it, you know, so I spent a lot of time being very concerned about what are these kids going to grow up to be. Now, obviously, I hope they all grow up and they're just like you, Travis, and they just <laughs> have this awakening and they mm -hmm. say, you know, 
this isn't for me and they walk away from it. And maybe we have a renaissance of enlightenment mm -hmm. and because these kids were raised in this repressive manner and they hate it, you know? Um, well, I will say on, on that note, um, it was a terrible experience <laughs> leaving everything behind, you know, and I mean, I, I became suicidal. I was very depressed. I almost did kill myself because I completely lost my identity. I lost the group of people that were closest to me. So I'm, I'm hoping to, you know, help save people from having to go through that process. Well, that's and, that's yeah. what I'm saying is that like, yeah. I, you know, I didn't mean to make it sound like it was automatic, but oh, sure. even best case scenario, the kid comes out on the other side and they're like you, that's not an easy process. I've met right. lots of people who have, who were sort of grew up as social justice warriors. Like they grew up with parents who were very left-leaning and then they right. believed that and they went to left-leaning colleges and they were, ah, you know, like their whole college life. And so the, the Trump election had the opposite impact on them or they mm -hmm. started down that path and then they started meeting Trump voters or something happened to them and they realized everything they had been taught was incorrect. Everything right. they thought about conservatives was wrong. Everything they thought about economics was wrong or they'd never even heard of, you know, Mao, you know, so like all these things sure. and they went, a lot of them went through major identity crises and like you said, were suicidal or had to lose all their friends, all their right. family, yeah. terribly disruptive to their lives. Right. So that's one of the things that animates me is like, I don't want kids, even if somebody says, oh, they'll outgrow it. I'm like, do you know what, how painful that process would be? For sure. Yeah. And how gypped would you feel, excuse the expression, but how ripped off <laughs> right. would you feel that your childhood, you only get one, <laughs> right? right? And I didn't go through what you went through, but I had a pretty crappy childhood just the same. And, you know, I have to remind myself, like, you're a grown up now, move on. But because if I dwell yeah. on it for too long, I get really angry at how that one and only chance I had to be a child and be innocent and not be parentified or not be adultified or whatever mm -hmm. was taken from me by self-interested adults. Yeah. And I see that happening to these kids, adults with an agenda narcissistic borderline personality disordered adults lots of the time are just projecting their values onto these little kids being like let me mold you into mm. the little woke army member that i want you to be right and it's so wrong they don't have that right to do i just totally mm. yeah Completely so agree. should we what about <laughs> um what about things aimed at kids specifically do you have any uh thoughts about taking your film or taking any of your stuff and adapting it for children it's a good question we're, we're they're not exactly kids but we we are taking parts of the series with pete uh, across the nation and going to be showing it to universities and you know those you know adult children <laughs> i guess uh, um and and then allowing them to to speak about their experiences and doing this kind of reverse Q and A, but uh, so so that's underway. But in terms of yeah, making content specifically for kids, I, know, I honestly haven't thought about it, but I think that's a good idea. You know, I think um, given especially that there are all these you know anti racist baby and not my idea and all these ridiculous children's books, I think there should be a concerted effort in the other direction. Um, and I think yeah, making making some videos about that would be would be great some little animations or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it would be good. I mean, I think that, I think this kind of content needs to be, you know, it needs to be out there for adults, but I think we also need to reproduce it for children because yeah, the, the people who believe in those woke ideas are creating all kinds of content for kids. Sure. And what I'm seeing is a kind of an absence of anything to respond to it or to counteract it. And I think, since we can't effectively ban that, right? You know, mm -hmm. it's free market of ideas. Um, we we just have to keep putting out better ideas. And some of those right. have to be aimed at children, provided they're um, you know, reasonable and responsible and all that kind of stuff. I mean, there was a there was a show a long time ago called Liberty's Kids, which was great. It was an animated mm -hmm. series about the revolution that I liked a lot. But um I think and I've seen some videos aimed at kids about critical thinking. Mm -hmm. online that are that talk about certain heuristics we use all the time that are actually kind of flawed mm -hmm. and logical fallacies but they're done with cute little animations so that's good so nice. i think there are things that could be done with some of your ideas 
yeah. just aimed for a younger audience um, that would be very effective. Even if all the kids do is watch something like that and then ask questions. Totally. That's yeah. what they need to do. They need to be empowered to ask the adults in their lives more questions. Right. As long as they can retain that, they can. It's like a little inoculation against right. that stuff. No, I think that's a great idea. Um, I know Pete has has been writing a children's book. Uh, I don't know if it's. I, I would assume that he's working in some some you know unwoke or anti woke material. Um, but I think it's about you know critical thinking and and skepticism and that that kind of thing. So it might be interesting to um you know to turn that into some kind of animation uh, for little little episodes for for kids. I think that would be great. The other thing I'd like to see is because um, one of the other things missing in general from the discourse in the last, I don't know how many years, and this might be something you're covering in uh, When in Doubt, is how to, for lack of a better term, like how to, how to show people grace, for lack of a better term, mm, like true. how to just let the small stuff slide. Um, right. we've gotten to a place where we're hyper vigilant and people say things like what I just said. Now, you mm -hmm. know where that, why that word was in my mind? Cause I know intellectually it's not appropriate. It's a, it's a slur now against the Roma people. I've been mm. reading my copy, my original copy of, and in fact, here it is. Cause I'm tutoring somebody who's reading it. This is my original copy of a wrinkle in time. Mm. Even has like where I wrote my name when I was a little kid. See how you, when you just love somebody doesn't steal your books. And Madeline Langle used that word in the dialogue mm. between some of the characters. And mm. I remember as I was reading it, I'm like, it, you know, I kind of jumped because now I've learned that's we wouldn't use that word today, but this was written in the 60s. So it's, you know, different sure. context. But that's probably why it was in my brain and I just spit it out. And then, of course, right. I corrected myself. But we have people, adults, kids, everybody who might hear something like that and be like, oh, you know, and, and that would right. be the end of a friendship that could be, it could be a really major problem. Yeah. And yeah. wouldn't it be great if we could just do some things to show kids being like, I assume benign intent. I assume you didn't mean right. it. It's probably not a big deal or even not say anything else about it. Just let it go till like the next time that doesn't make you a doormat. That doesn't make you a pushover. That doesn't make the other person a bad person. Like we don't seem to have the proper level anymore of just basic everyday decency and tolerance for other people's foibles. Yeah. Yeah. It's really sad. Um, I, I definitely agree. I think people need to just not, not sweat the small stuff and, in in the book how to have impossible conversations by peter and james you know they they say and i i'm using that sort of as a, as a foundational text for when in doubt um they say let friends be wrong you know yeah it, just it's okay if you don't agree or it's okay if someone slips up or says something maybe that they shouldn't have or right. and it just really shouldn't be that big of a deal you know i mean especially if it's just verbal you know i mean are they actually do, doing harm by by saying the word jip for instance i mean who, who's really harmed by that i, I don't know exactly. <laughs> you know i mean i think it's exactly. it's good to be cognizant of of these things and and sensitive to a degree but i think people are overly sensitive and people should just calm down <laughs> well and i don't buy it either i think the people who get the most exercised about stuff like this don't actually care hmm. i don't believe them for a second that they really care or that they're really harmed or they care about the people they allege were harmed or anything like, I mean, this stuff with Whoopi Goldberg recently, mm -hmm. I heard what she said. I thought it was dumb sure. and, uh, you know, kind of ignorant and stuff and not how Weird. I would have thought. But at the end yeah. of the day, I was like, so what? I mean, the way right. I deal with people like that is I don't listen to them, you know, and right. the, I, the fact that people were saying and then speaking on behalf of Jews, like, OK, well, I grew up Jewish and I'm like, you're not helping me. <laughs> mm -hmm. And if you if you're really concerned about Jewish people, then maybe you should be a little more animated about some of the really deeply anti-Semitic, scary ideas that are coming out of California's ethnic studies program. Like mm -hmm. focus some of your energy on that because millions of children are being taught some very right. disturbing ideas about Jewish people. Whoopi's comment is totally inconsequential. And yet that's getting all the airtime. Right. And the other right. thing is untouchable. Like yeah, priorities yeah. are messed up for sure. 
Yeah, it's it's hard to say what a person's inner experience is. I think you're right that a lot of people probably don't care that much and they're just doing it for show or again virtue signaling. But but some people do, you know. I mean, yeah, g- I given see. given that I grew up with with true believers that would do terrible things because of their beliefs, I, I'm I'm more in the camp that I think some people. I'm, some people's minds and morality really have been hijacked to such a degree that they actually do, you know, shake and, and get upset and, and feel terrible. Um, but you know, it's, it can be ridiculous, (laughs) you know, Uh, but when I was growing up, I was taught you're not responsible for mm -hmm. the, the reactions and feelings of other people. Sure. You know, I mean, unless, it's very obvious that you are. In other words, if you say something like you're a this or you're, you know, being outwardly right. mean to somebody, but if you say that so you slip up, you say something totally. or just people don't like you, like that's to a large degree, their problem and vice versa. Right. I was also taught that, you know, not everyone's going to like you. Um, probably the majority of people aren't. And it doesn't mean they hate you. They're just going to be like, whatever. Like they're just right. not going to think about you at all. People, most people you're worried about aren't even thinking about you. They're busy thinking about other things. Right. Um, if someone doesn't want to be your friend, you probably weren't meant to be friends. I mean, you know, this is what I was taught. And it feels like we're teaching kids like the opposite. And mm-hmm. it's causing them a lot of pain um, yeah. because the expectations are out of balance with reality. And they right. want to make reality reality conform to their expectations or their hopes or their wishes or whatever. Right. Yeah, t- t- totally. <clears throat> Excuse me. Would you say that woke is to a large degree that, that there are people who are very uncomfortable with reality and they want it to be different and they can't handle it? Yeah. I mean, I think that feeds into that, that narrative or story idea, um, to some degree, uh, or is, is kind of along the same lines, which is that, you know, they're probably un- unhappy with their lives, unhappy with, um, the, the lack of meaning in their lives, their lack of purpose, unhappy with certain things in society mm-hmm. and therefore latch onto this as, you know, this sort of utopian solution to all right. these things. Yeah. Right. It's just, amazing to me that anyone would believe in this stuff. That's been the hardest thing for me about Mm. covering all of this as a like pseudo journalist or whatever, Mm. or fake journalist as they call us now, um, (laughs) has been that it's really difficult for me to put myself in the shoes of the people who believe it. And it's also really difficult for me to believe that it is ignorance and not malice. And I know everybody Mm. says like, it's usually more incompetence or ignorance it's not malice mm. and i'm like i i don't i don't know <laughs> i think there's yeah. a lot of malice actually yeah so, i mean i think there's probably both right uh, you know both ignorance and and malice um and then the malice becomes justified because this is a righteous cause we're fighting racism we're fighting sexism we're fighting homophobia yeah. you know homophobia etc and so right. then it's justifiable you know which is right. unfortunate yeah, that and the scary thing about that is I think the ideas are so outrageous that they're justifying mm-hmm. and there doesn't seem to be an outer limit. And like we talked about there aren't any limiting principles. So right. if they keep justifying them, like when does it stop? There, you know, like it, you you could really get to the point of justifying <clears throat> killing people. Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah, I, I know people who have justified that. I mean, in, in Portland, Aaron J. Danielson was a member of the Patriot Prayer, it's just a conservative right wing group. Um, they're not white supremacists. Uh, right. And and yet this guy was killed in the middle of the street, shot by this Antifa radical. And I, my ex-girlfriend was celebrating his death. And it just blew my mind. I'm just, you know, like we're, we're just killing people in the street now. That's OK. And she was like, "Oh yeah, it's just one for one for our team." And I'm like, "I have no idea what you're talking about. That's it, totally That's insane." Horrifying. Yeah, yeah, it really is. And th- the fact that people have already been brainwashed to that degree to justify murder should alarm everyone. Yeah, it's yeah. I mean, I saw one or two people in the street saying, "You know, one one down or one less, whatever." Um, And I was horrified then, but I guess I thought maybe that's a one-off or that's just that small group of people they're they're mugging for the cameras or that, you know, but if you're saying there are lots of people out there who agree with that, that's really quite scary. It is. Yeah. 
I mean, I don't, I, I can't quantify how many there are, but it's just, and I obviously must have some kind of bias living in Portland and just knowing a lot of the people who do go along with that kind of stuff. So outside of Portland, you know, in, in a red state or city, it's probably very different, <laughs> but yeah. I am, I'm certainly alarmed by the number of people who believe in that kind of thing here or downplay, even if they don't justify murder, they downplay, you know, the effects of, you know, getting rid of the police and just how terrible that is. And, you know, all of the other things that have real, real world consequences that are really unfortunate. <clears throat> That's amazing. I mean, are they not impacted by the, the defunding of the police that are, did they not look around and see what the just downtown area just gutted and. Well, oft, I mean, often they, they don't live downtown and they live in the suburbs and they're wealthy and they are not affected by the policies that they vote in or enact. And that's, you know, just like the mayor here uh, doesn't, doesn't live in, in the, in the city anymore. Um, and I think it's the same with Lori Lightfoot um, if I remember correctly, but there are a number of people who, who are in positions of power who don't live in those cities where they defund the police or get rid of the gun violence reduction team uh, here. Uh, and they don't they just don't have to care. You know, or See, they, now or that's they have one thing own. I would support. I would support making it mandatory for elected officials yeah. to live in the cities where they govern. They should have to be subject sure. to the policies they put in place. That is absolutely third world level of crazy to right. say, I'm going to support something and then I'm going to go sequester myself off in a safe place where I don't have to deal with it. Um, that yeah. I would be absolutely all for that kind of a mandate that they have to, you're an elected official, you're collecting a taxpayer funded salary. You need to live where you govern. I, yeah, I completely agree. It's, it's insane that that isn't the case already to me. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. crazy. I mean, I was, <clears throat> I was thought it was bad enough that for example, like the mayor of New York city lived in Gracie mansion was, was like off away from everything you know mm, it's like but at yeah. least it's still in new york <laughs> it's not <laughs> like in a, in a suburb or something they're not living in greenwich or you know or, right. or or even long island um i i think that's outrageous and yeah i've often wondered whenever i've seen those protests in portland and people have told me like oh those are suburban kids and they're larping or whatever i've thought who are their parents Mm -hmm. And what do they say when they come home at all hours or whatever? It's like, Hey mom, I'm going out in my, like wearing all black or whatever, or <laughs> just like, where do their parents think they are? Or do their parents support this? Are they literally financing it? These people don't look like they're yeah. gainfully employed. No, uh, pr you know, some, sometimes they are, but, but often they're not. Um, but there, there is some very clear organization and very clear, backers for this stuff because i mean these people have sprinter vans and fully you know automatic machine guns and like i, I went to the red house uh which was kind of a, a small autonomous zone that happened in uh, december of 2020 and i filmed it multiple times and i saw all these supplies they raised three hundred thousand dollars for this family that was being you know, kick, kicked out of their house because they purposely didn't pay their mortgage for something like two years and they shouldn't have been living there. And um, yeah, it's just, it, there's, there's clearly money coming in from somewhere, you know? Um, and I'm sure some parents do support their, their kids in, in, in this stuff because it's, it's Portland and they're very, you know, pretty far left leaning people that live here. Um, and some of them, probably don't have parents or, or just, you know, off away at, at college or just sort of doing their own thing. And there's also a huge homeless population here, you know, people camping in, in the street and they either get involved or, you know, the Antifa types get them involved with this stuff. Um, so it's a, it's sort of a mishmash of a lot of, uh, different people. I heard there were a lot of teachers too. Yeah. I've, I've heard that sort too. of unmasked as being public school teachers. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Which pretty kind of alarming. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Can you imagine sure. like my teacher, the Antifa member? <laughs> um, <laughs> right. Yeah, no, it's it's quite frightening because then you start thinking maybe they'll start recruiting their students and maybe they do. Right. Yeah. Or again, maybe just, you. you know, influencing them and indoctrinating them for sure. Right. But that's never called an insurrection when they even when they go after federal property. That's not an insurrection. <laughs> Right. I just I always find that the hypocrisy hilarious, you know, and it's you don't even have to support what went on, at, you know, January sure. 6th to realize to see the parallels and wonder why the discrepancy. Um, yeah, the people are treated. Well, and, and most of the people that I know 
when January 6th happened that live here um, just, you know, thought it was the most appalling thing that they've ever seen. And I was like, yeah, I mean, it is appalling, but have you paid attention all summer? Right. <laughs> like yeah. way more people died in, you know, the BLM riots and way more businesses and livelihoods were destroyed and cars right. were burned. And, you know, I mean, it was just a right. hundred times worse. <laughs> right. I think we need to clarify that that was your ex-girlfriend who was cheering on the death of that guy, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, because somebody was like, if my girlfriend was saying that. <laughs> oh, no, I, yeah, no, no, we, we a... were already broken up at the time. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so don't, don't, don't judge Travis. <laughs> yeah. um, so anyway, so the, the film, so you're basically, uh, the Woke Reformation series is still ongoing or done? No, it's still ongoing. I've I've it's got a, a couple episodes planned, um, and I'll I'll keep doing stuff. And I really like that idea of making content for for kids. Um, but I, I'll pro probably try to put that out all over the place, not just locals. Um, yeah. But yeah, and then I've I've um, kind of come up with a plan to turn it into a feature film to try to get it in theaters and you know wherever it, it, it can be shown. You know, hopefully right. Amazon, Google, and stuff like that. Right. Um, so that that's one of my next goals and and then also i'm occasionally getting back to filming my other uh movie when in doubt so okay got a lot and when in on. doubt is the when in doubt is the one that is about the uh, uh having the conversations right you know sort of like yeah yeah it's 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 a much more i'm much more neutral in that i'm not taking anyone's side i'm just trying to provide people tools to talk across ideological divides and to understand why we're so polarized at the beginning you know in the first place and to just mm -hmm. offer people um a way through that polarization or to reduce that, you know? So. Yeah. And some people say, well, I've said um, that polarization is actually ironically a thing sort of saving us right now. <laughs> hmm. Meaning like if we were my, my, my argument there is that if we're dealing with a, you know, sort of a, a, a pendulum that has swung so far to the left. Mm -hmm. And th as we talked about earlier, the vast majority of people are not there, you know, right. like they're, they're not with them that yeah. if these people tried too much to get along with that, you know, tried to move to where they are bad, really bad things. But I mean, we wouldn't be America anymore. Right. Oh, so sure. While it, yeah. it appears that we're polarized because we're not agreeing with this extremist leftist view. The number of people who are on the other pole, like the far right, are actually mm -hmm. they exist and right. they're scary, <laughs> but there are fewer of them in terms of they haven't captured the major institutions oh, sure. of our country, whatever. I mean, they exist, but we don't really want you know, to have either of these two poles talking to each other, that would be bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. That would be Hitler. Um, but, and, and we, and this vast group here holding the line is what we're calling polarization, but it's kind of not, is sort of my, my point. It's not really mm. polarization. Yeah. I guess I'd look at it a little differently. I, I don't think reducing polarization means that you need to move to the left at all. I, and I don't think it means that you need to accept those ideas even. Um, uh, I, I just, I just look at, you know, what's happening in the news, what's happening with, you know, both, you know, right and left wing pundits and the way that they talk about the other side. Um, that's what I mean when I, when I talk about polarization, the fact that we're just so, as we were talking about earlier, so uncharitable to, other people and what their views are and, you know, don't allow for any grace um, or forgiveness um, if they deviate from, from our side. Um, so that's really what I mean when I talk about reducing polarization, I'm, I'm interested oh, in, okay. in helping people understand, you know, why, why we're divided and, and, and what can be done about that. That doesn't necessarily mean, right. you know, moving in a particular left or right direction. Um, it's really okay. just more about understanding and being, being able to communicate, you know, for instance, I, I, and it's not just about politics, it's about religion too. Um, I put my mom and, and myself in my film because she's a Christian and I'm an, you know, agnostic atheist. And um, so I, I just, wanted us to be able to find a way to talk about some important issues. And, and, and that's really my goal. Like wherever you stand politically or re religiously, like we have to be able to communicate with each other in a reasonable way in order to get right. things done. And that's really what I'm focused on. Yeah. I mean, I agree with that idea. I think that there's just, 
I've seen a big push um, and it's almost exclusively from people who were what you might have called like mainstream left leaning or mainstream mm -hmm. liberal. OK, as opposed to conservative. Um, big, big push to say, you know, hey, conservatives, you need to do X. And that's been mm -hmm. going on for decades. Like, you know, sure. you people need to change. And I've yet to see I really have yet to see the same thought of like, you know, maybe I was a little bit wrong about people who are on the so-called right, like the near right, you mm -hmm. know, not again, not like way off, sure. just like not way off on the left. And it's there are people pushing back on that because if you were conservative or conservative leaning for the past, you know, 20, 30 years, you've pretty much taken a beating. Mm -hmm. In the mainstream media, in education, in you know most institutions, any job that you've held, you've been you've known you better keep your mouth shut, with very few exceptions. Like if you lived in certain red red enclaves and red states, you could have maybe gotten away with it. But sure. I certainly felt it, and I'm not really conservative. I just was compared to like New York City left leaning right. people. I I was the right winger, right. and so when people say things to me or people like me, like, well, you need to understand. I'm like, you know, I'm kind of done. <laughs> it's like I've sure. reached the point where you've had your way and I've mm -hmm. been civil and I've tried to meet you halfway or I've tried to have civil conversations with you. I've tried to explain to you and even show evidence as to why your cockamamie ideas or cockamamie ideas or whatever. I mean, and mm. obviously you don't call it like that initially, but, and I'm, I'm, I'm done being the grown up in the room. There's a fair amount of people who feel that way. What would sure. you say to that sentiment? Because it's real. It's real. And I would say it's growing. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I don't think understanding someone means accepting their ideas or even forgiving that person or anything like that. Um, I mean, in both of our cases, we actually do understand this stuff quite well. And that allows us to offer alternatives and, you know, something, something helpful. So, um, mm -hmm. so yeah, I, I don't, I'm not advocating for necessarily, um, just like forgive and forget just, you know, uh, peace and love. It's really more of just, um, f f like for instance, finding ways to talk to your relative who disagrees with you, right. It's right. Okay. Somebody in your family, a, a friend of yours, not, not losing friendships just because you disagree religiously or politically, um, and just, again, that idea of like letting, letting friends be wrong or, or, you know, allowing people to have different views. Um, yeah. and then at the same time, like, obviously I'm putting all this effort into making this series and this other film about trying to help people fight back against really corrosive ideas. I'm not saying people should accept these ideas or accept them to run roughshod over our institutions or anything like that. So it's, um, it's a little bit of a balancing act, I suppose, but, um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I think the, the more we can understand the way people think, the more we can understand why our position might be the right one. I mean, that's right. that's a, an idea from, um, you know, from John, John Stuart Mill, the idea of uh, the quote is something like he who knows only his side of the case knows little of that. And so it's it's crucial to know why people disagree with you and what you know, what other opinions about something something is. Um, so that's really the orientation that I have toward making this film. Oh, that's great. And I mean, that makes, that makes a lot of sense to me. Like I said, I'm sort of somewhat playing devil's advocate here because, sure. you know, I want you to be successful. I want the film to be successful. And just to let you know that that's something I've noticed as a trend that people, totally. they start seeing any suggestion that we need to do a better job of communicating with people who disagree with us. And there's this like, are you right. suggesting that I have to back down again? Or are you suggesting that I have to come to the table again? I've been at the table and nobody's talked to me. And sure. it's a, you know, I'm, I'm sympathetic to both, you know, points of view yeah. um, because I've been that person and it's, it, it does get really, really frustrating when you go in good faith to have conversations with people or you approach people in good faith right. and you're met with ad hominem and, you know, all kinds of ugliness. And after a while, people do get, kind of hardened and calloused and they just don't want to extend themselves, extend the, their hand. Yeah. Yeah. It's a real challenge. I mean, the same thing happens in, in personal relationships, you know, romantic relationships. Like you, it, it's, it's, it's good to like be kind and understanding, but it's also good to have reasonable, healthy boundaries. Right. And I think that's true in any kind of relationship uh, because yeah, you, it's, it's not healthy to just allow someone to, 
you know, insult you or to hurt you in some way. Um, mm -hmm. So, I, yeah, I think it's it's totally reasonable to to have these healthy boundaries, to to vote in a, a different way, to speak out against this stuff. Um, I think that's all perfectly reasonable. Now, this is an interesting <clears throat> point here. Uh, Bart says, historically, there was more crossover in political perspectives between the two parties. Very true. Now it's far apart and there are interests whose financial incentives are built on encouraging conflict. You mentioned the Matt Taibbi book. Right. And the whole like hate ink. Right. That concept. They, they, the press literally makes a lot more money when we're at each other's throats. For sure. And so one thing that I have seen be successful, and maybe you've seen this as well, is when people take the approach, start with common goals like you want to support yep. your family right i don't care who you are this is a goal everyone pretty much has like you want to support yourself and support your family and you know be able to make ends meet okay that seems like right. a common goal that we all have and when you can point out that there are people out there who have goals that are against yours or that are that they benefit from you fighting with each other instead of looking at what they're doing right then people have some kind of common ground to say, sure. you know, like, I don't agree with you about everything, but we have this, it's, and I hate to say it, not common enemy, but we have our common sure. goal is not being well served because we're bickering with each other instead of the people who are actually in our way. Right, right. So calling out those ideas seems like it could also be effective. Yeah, definitely. And uh, yeah, Jonathan Hyde has talked a lot about uh, our polarization in his book, The Righteous Mind. And I highly recommend that for anyone who who um, likes to read uh, that reading that book back in whatever it was, 2016 or 2017 was really what set me on the path to want to make this film in the first place. Um, mm -hmm. Because I think just having a better understanding of, of our common goals and our common humanity uh, and the fact that there should be, again, separation of, of church and state or, or the, you know, these politics seeping into the classroom, then that, that will allow for people to have differing opinions, to you know teach those opinions to their kids. That's fine, um, but uh, you know allowing a separation from from all this political insanity uh, from the people who just don't want to be involved with politics or who just want to go live their lives and be productive. And right. Um, right. and I, I, I'm hoping that to create more space for that. And like that's really the goal. Like we're, right. we're so deranged by politics at this point that. Any anything that I can think of to do to help re reduce that uh, influence and that derangement is what I want to do. Yeah, I think it's great, and um, I obviously am excited that you're doing it because uh, the the more people that are putting out content that aim to do something constructive and productive, the more the destructive will fail. <laughs> right. <laughs> so right. I think it really just it, to a large degree comes down to that. And then of course, when it's high quality, like stuff you're doing even better. Um, I, I definitely am excited that you're even contemplating the idea of doing stuff for kids because obviously that's my yeah, that's interest, great, but great idea. But I still think parents, parents watching, if there are any of you, um, there's a lot to, uh, to watch in the content that's already up. There's a segment on what decolonizing math means. Um, there's, you know, what to do if your child starts talking about decolonizing a school. So there's, uh, there, there's already content in the woke reformation, um, episodes that will help you if you're dealing with this in your child's school or dealing with this in your child's life. Um, so right. definitely go and join, um, the locals community and that you will find, let me put up the banner. I hope I got it right. The woke reformation.locals.com. Yep. Let's join that it. you can also that will you will also be supporting travis's work which is important because then we can get these things made into future films and so forth and everyone can see them hopefully yeah i appreciate that it would be, that would be great so travis thank you so much for coming and talking to me about these issues i hope i wasn't too 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 direct in some of my questions but oh, i no. really just great. Had, i was very curious about some of these things because it's not often you get to talk to somebody who grew up in an environment where there were such dogmatic, you know, ideas. And, right. you know, I'm glad you shared with people that it's not an easy process to get out of that. Yeah. Not at all. Not at all. For sure. Yeah. So, and I hope you're feeling better soon with your back too. Thanks. Yeah. I think I will. Be. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, guys, thanks everyone for coming. I hope everybody has a wonderful weekend. Please do go join the woke reformations.locals.com. Please share this broadcast out with all your friends and relatives and everybody who's interested in this topic. And I will see you next time. Have a great weekend.
Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Thanks for